Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived chiefly to let me spend more time than is available on the radio with people that I've either always wanted to meet or always wanted to spend a bit more time with than is ordinarily wait, available. Wait, what the, are we doing? We could have done the, a radio interview? Oh, no, Hang this, on. This is a full-length, full-fat version. Ah, it's too late now. I thought this was partial disclosure. That show I love. <laughs> this sounds awful. Incremental disclosure. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Carr, <laughs> in case you haven't worked it out already, is, is this week's guest. And, and thank you for coming in. Oh, no, it's my absolute pleasure. Yeah, we shall an see. easy spin on the tube. Let's have a chat. Yeah, let's. Um, it, it, you've got a book out, Before and Laughter, which uh, all the other reviewers have, have, have queued up to say, I, when I read that it was a self-help book, I thought he'd be taking the piss. And then it turns out that he isn't. But it, it, It's still it, funny, though, right? It, it, I mean, even though I'm not taking the piss. No, it's, it's, I mean, of course it's funny. It's got some it would laughs. Be a, it'd be a bit weird if it wasn't, wouldn't it? Well, be, I felt like... quite well, a departure. Well... As a self-help book, not being funny would be the absolute norm. That section of the bookstore is so earnest yes. and also so good. It's brilliant stuff, but they haven't sugared the pill. They go, the stuff that we have in the world of um, sort of West Coast yeah. human potential movement, the stuff that we've got is so good, they feel so confident that they can be boring. Yes. And I think that's always a mistake because I think the people that really would benefit most from that stuff are people that won't necessarily find it. And, you know, you're, they're preaching to the choir. So, of course, Oprah's into that and she's getting all, reaping the benefits from that wisdom. But the problem with that wisdom is it's just, ah. So you're trying to smuggle self-help into people's lives. Yeah. Essentially, yeah, under, under the guise of your... Jokes. ...your reputation. <laughs> ah. Jokes. And, yeah. And, well, and by not kind of being earnest. I but, suppose but it's that thing, not trying to smuggle self-help, but I was trying to be myself. Yes. That's what I'm like. I sent it to a couple of my very close friends and I wanted the book, when I set out to do it, to approximate lunch and a long walk with me. I wanted it to feel like you knew who I was. Okay. And I think, I sent it to a couple of close friends and they sort of agreed that, they, yeah, that's pretty much who, who you are. Funny, but also, you know, we'll talk about serious right away. We won't do, I'm not big on small talk. No, I clearly. like talking about what matters and what's important to people and where they're going and what's going on. And, and it is, I mean, it is like being spoken to as opposed to spoken at, which is hopefully what, what, what some no, self-help Hopefully there's no waggy finger no in waggy this. waggy fingers. Um, but your enthusiasm for the genre is 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 deep deep and sincere. Changed I mean, my life. But Changed this my is life one totally. of the many things I find so interesting about you is that you, you have a you have a slightly uh, curt exterior, a, sli a slightly, you, you know... You, I think you, if you, you saw me on stage, you would think... But, I mean, so it, that's who I am on stage. I'm not sort of... But I would expect you to take the piss out of self-help books. Yeah, but, you know, it's, I find them incredibly valuable and useful. And I think it's OK to be funny about stuff. It's OK to joke about stuff mm. and to also be serious about it. And you're also a poster boy for, for them because, and, and this is where we'll sort of begin, you, 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 you reach your sort of 25th, 26th year and have a, have a kind of um, a complete reassessment, a very early I think early I describe it as a crisis, quarter life crisis. A quarter life crisis. crisis. So but I think that's... You know, for me as well, it's it's not really about age because I think a lot of people will read this and hopefully be inspired to do something, change their life. Yes. It ain't about being 25. I spent my life... I put a whole chapter in the book of, like, yeah. people that made it late. Yeah. People that came to it late because I find that very inspiring. I remember reading an interview with an actor years and years ago and he was talking about people that didn't have a leading role till they were in their 40s. I remember thinking, that's great because I'm so... Um, I'm not a fan of the Instagram world where everything looks perfect and you only see results. You never see the hard work. Here's how much respect we have as a society for the slog, for the hard work. The montage in a Rocky movie. Mm -hmm. You go, <laughs> boxing is the hardest thing you can do. And they go, right, up and down the steps in Philadelphia, good rock track. We could cover this. He'll eat a couple of raw eggs, cover this in 40 seconds, and then we're back to the drama. You've, you've underestimated the impact of the Russian one when he's lifting logs and, and, and well, wading I mean, through snow. It's great, thigh again, high snow. It's a montage. It goes a lot deeper, but it is it's a brief. A it's a brief. It's but a brief But that thing montage. of, like, going, I wanted to kind of share, look, this is my journey, this is what I sort of did, and the thing that changed was my beliefs. Yeah. Fundamentally, I think that's with everyone. Whether they realise it or not, the thing that changes your life is your beliefs. That's where it begins. So your belief system changing is is the thing that drives you forward and then asking yourself the right questions and getting the real answers. You know, the fundamental question in life being, what do you want? Yes. In any scenario. And what you wanted at that stage in your life was a difference, life, change, success, a, life, a bit of attention. A life less ordinary. Yes, of course. I wanted, I wanted to do something that I loved. Well, let's I run. didn't want to... You know that thing of... 
uh, you know, and everything in the genre is a cliche. Yeah. So that's why you can be sort of funny about it because it's kind of familiar. Even if you haven't read the books, you're familiar with the kind of the cliches of going, well, I wanted to, uh, I didn't want to work to live. Yeah, I wanted to live to work. I wanted to find something that I found so enjoyable it didn't feel like I was working. That's an incredibly privileged position. Yes, of course. But you would imagine it's blind luck. If you take a look at Instagram or the TV, you go, well, it's, it's, it's pretty people doing great things. Uh, you know, dope people doing dope Yeah, yeah. And that's great on, on the surface level, but actually as soon as you pick it apart, you go, 10,000 hours doesn't even begin to cover it. The Gladwell thing I love, sure. the idea, the focus on the graft, the yes. work, because the, there's two great myths in our society. One is a genius. This guy's so good, it always would have happened. Yeah. You know, but take Michael, Michael Jordan, right? Sure. The GOAT, the greatest ever yeah. basketball player. If he didn't train... I mean, if, if The Last Dance shows you anything, it's the guy trained like a maniac. Yes. So he had that initial, he had something. He had a, a, a bit of edge. That was the thing he did best. Not better than anyone else in the world. Sure. But it was better than anything else he did was basketball. And then he put all the work into that. And then suddenly he's the greatest. Uh, but the myth of like, he's a genius or he worked so hard. It's often in the business world. He worked so hard. He put the hours in. Yeah. He only sleeps three hours a night. This guy's a... It's total bullshit, both of them. It's always a mix of the two. And, you know, I took in the, in the book about, I love this phrase. My friend's dad used to say it when we were kids. John Thick used to say, be lucky. Yeah. Proper Cockney bloke. He used to go, be lucky. And luck and happiness in German is the same. And I like the idea that luck... I never understood it at the time. I liked sure. it, but I didn't really get it. Be happy. Be, be, be you know... And you make your own luck. You well, go, that's the point. You as buy if it the is lottery a choice. ticket. It is. A, you, you, that, that, that's the bit that is both. I think it is, and that from seductive where and slightly troubling. From where I'm calling from, I'm aware that could that could slightly rub people up the wrong way. It's easy for you to say. Yeah. Rich and famous comic off TV, but I genuinely think, to an extent, you make your own luck. So the the work you put in and working hard is one thing, but working smart. So the idea of going, well, where are you going to focus? That, that attention. Sure. Because I could work as hard as I want as a footballer. I'm never going to make uh, it. Do you know, oddly, reading it, I thought of a story which I'd forgotten about for 20 years, which was about a bloke who decided, he looked at all the things that he could do sports-wise by the time he reached his 20s or 30s. Obviously, that rules out a lot. Yeah. And he decided that if he really put in the hard hours, he could probably be a famous darts player. And it never happened. It never, I mean, it never just, I, I keep thinking, before yeah. I came in, I was planning to look him up and find out what happened. But it is, it's that idea that if you if you put in the hard yards, you, you can make something happen within well, the bounds of, because you mentioned that some people, the, you could have tried to be a here's footballer. Here's the other thing, right? I'm, I'm promoting, ostensibly, I mean, it's nice just to talk to you, but promoting a self-help book. So it is a legal requirement that I must say, it's the journey, not it's the destination. The journey, not, I'm going to have to say that at least three more times. No, no, I'll, keep, I'll, keep, I'll keep count. But you know, it, it, you, that it, thing of like going, I started doing comedy not to be rich and famous. I got successful way before you'd heard of me. Yes. I got successful when I was playing the comedy store in Leicester Square and the banana cabaret in Balham, mm. and I was getting paid in cash, yeah. which obviously I love. I'm sure we'll come on to that <laughs> later on. But getting paid in cash, I was literally and metaphorically living off my wits. That success for me. It happened much earlier than TV, sure. than even the Edinburgh Festival well, and doing well. It's For me, it's that thing of going, I loved the job so much. Like, musicians is another good example, or sports people that go, they get into a, uh, a zone, uh, a flow state yeah. through work. That they That is where pleasure lives. That's where happiness resides. And their success is, is, might not be material. You know, the darts player might have never sure. made it, but is he happy? That's the measure. Let's talk a bit about the ordinary life then, b b before the change. There's not, it's, it's, I mean, it's it, it sort of four books, isn't it? It's, there's a bit of autobiography, there's a lot of self-help. It's a bit of commonplace book. I, at school, we had, we were encouraged to write down things that had moved us or inspired us or touched us. There's, there's, there's a bit of that. Well, I, I think like writing there. a narrative biography seems ludicrous, unless you're Winston Churchill. Um, who has a life that's that interesting? Like, yes. well, I was born here, and then I'll just take you through everything that happened. Just yeah. seems like very dull. But those the moments that were, I also wanted something that reflected what I was saying in the book. But you sometimes so, drop bombs, Jimmy. So I mean, there are grenades where you want to find out a little bit more about please, have various things. Well, no, I mean, you, you've you've answered most of the questions before. If I was going to be obvious, so I can't believe you got through three years at Cambridge University without ever having sex. I mean, that that is 
yeah, but you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a strange thing. But you told thing. me that you had great friendships with women. So I start thinking then. I wonder if that was linked to the Catholicism. I wonder if that was linked to the guilt, the relationship with your father, the fact that you had to step into his shoes. So I disagree. I think it was. I more, quite like the autobiography. I think it was more. Um, more to my relationship with my mother and being right. enmeshed is, yes. is the term they use in therapy. Because she, uh, after your parents split up, she... No, well, they, yeah, they split up. even before. I think even before that, I was very much kind of the, the you know, the surrogate, you know, person that she talked to. Why are to. you? Why the middle son? Why, why, why uh, were the other two at that time? I'm the most fun. Is that what it was? No, I mean, well, like, we just got on very well. I mean, it's but there's it another is, contradiction. My, my younger brother was was too young, okay. and my older brother, you know, it, we had a we had a lovely relationship, and I don't regret that for a second. But the other reason to share that in a book, the other yes. re reason to talk openly, is again that thing of social media and Instagram, and what you imagine everyone in the world is having three ways at eighteen. Sure, if you're looking at, you know. You know uh, the pornography, which is yeah, what I call the internet. The pornography. <laughs> the pornography. It was on the pornography. You know, you can book train tickets Crucial on it as well. It's a definite article. <laughs> but the idea that you go, it's all happening for everyone all the time. Yeah. Different people mature at different times. That's fine. It's not like a race. And I think the more people that talk about that and normalize it, the better. I'm very sex positive. Whatever you want to do with whoever, great. But I felt very uh, under pressure. Yeah. To, to do something and, and actually that was kind of crazy it becomes too big a deal you know if you if you wait too long to do something fear attaches itself yes of course it grows uh, you know it grows and then it becomes a big deal in your head the childhood then there's not a lot in there about your childhood really what what i mean what well, when you sat down to write it did you know it was going to be like this? Because it's a very rare book for someone in your position. It's a, as you, it's the, the, there's a mixture here of evangelism, isn't there? A, a, which is I'm a big fan of like I, I'm a. But it's an odd impulse that to want to help people. I, some of your comedy, obviously, I mean, it can, is. I've it, been helped a lot. You know, I think if you looked at my comedic style, you might go, "Well, this guy is going to be an arsehole. And it wouldn't be that. that well, be you know, fair. but okay. So the thing, the the book came out of a uh, a phone call, yeah. uh, and an email from Adam K. Okay. So okay. Adam K. calls and he wrote that brilliant. Uh, I mean, it's much better than my book. By that, um, this is going to hurt about sure. his years in Obs and Gynae, um as a doctor. It's brilliant. And then about sort of six weeks into the lockdown, he he wrote me an email and said, "Look, we're doing this book for the NHS. Do you oh, want to yes. yes. write a piece?" And I went, yeah, I'll, I'll write something. And I wrote about my mother dying in, I mean, just across the road. I always think yeah. of it whenever I come to Do this you? Westminster Tubes where we're recording this. And um, it's just across from Parliament, guys yeah. in St. Thomas. And my, my mum was in the intensive care there for about nine months uh, and died there, you know, very slowly of pancreatitis. And, you know, we were there at the end. And I wrote about that. And I wrote about the pain uh, team there yes. and how a lot of what medicine is, is letting people die with dignity and how special that is, uh, and how that's coming for us all. And there's something about writing that piece I found very cathartic. Mm. I found like I was thinking about my mother uh, in a way that I hadn't for a long time, like really, you know, focused on it. There's that, I read a book 20 years ago. Yes. Um, is it Milan Kundra? I, can, I never pronounced the name. Unbearable Lightness of Being, is it? Yeah, but he yeah. wrote another book called Slowness, a very okay. thin novel. Uh, and it's about how memory and speed are inversely proportionate, about right. how when yeah. the world slows down, you remember and i was yes. used to living this incredibly frenetic life for 20 years and then a lot of change for me i'd become a father for the first time two years ago and the world had stopped and suddenly i was in this stasis and it felt like looking back was a very productive thing to do and and then through looking back i was sort of thinking well what do i want for my son yeah so the book might seem generous but it's also who's it for well it was for me when i was 25 i wish i'd come across something like this and it was for my son it was like going well you know what do you, if i walk out here and get you know sure someone detonates the, the bomb and you you're gone what do you leave them and you go well i'd like to leave this is what i think about the world. what i've learned in a way yeah this is this is what i've learned for better for worse this is where i'm calling from and f for now yes this might change again i mean i don't believe because <laughs> i'm an atheist well <laughs> i don't believe in like a an afterlife sure but i'm very passionate about there being a next life and I, i'm an advocate for that because i go whoever whoever you are now this too shall pass yes and however you you know so i'm, I'm i tell incredibly okay. edgy jokes on stage so, and yeah but, but it'll change but now i'm a father and that feels like there's been a real step change for me i still tell very edgy jokes still write very edgy jokes i love that but there's another facet now i was working in middle management for an oil company and i changed yeah and i feel like the gift I got was very early on in life. 
about 16. And my mum had an inkling that I was brighter than I was being. I was at a school called Burnham Grammar yeah. on the Britwell estate, quite a big estate where they cleared, they cleared the slums of the East End out to the Britwell and Salt Hill estate in Slough. And we were living just off that and went to this grammar school there and was not a tear away, sure. but was funny and uh, outrageous and didn't really pay attention and just about scraped through. Okay. And my mum heard from like someone's, uh, someone's mum was like giving a shit about how bright her kid was. It's like, ah, oh, yeah. fuck this lady. And <laughs> oh, Jesus, get over yourself. And then she heard about this other school that was called uh, the Royal Grammar High yeah. Wycombe. And I moved schools at 16. She like called the guy and went, yeah, I want my boy to come here. It's like a bus and a train and a walk and a whatever. And I moved schools at 16. You become aware very early on in life that you are a story you tell yourself. Right. Because I went from being a tearaway to suddenly having no baggage. I didn't know anyone at this so new you school. You from scratch. Yeah, and I had, I had one friend. My friend Toby was at that school. Okay. And our mums knew each other. We lived close to each other. And uh, but he'd always been there. And he knew me and was like, great. And then I, I arrived there and went, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm going to be, somebody be different. maybe I'm going to be academic and okay. go to Cambridge. And even though I couldn't really, I mean, it, I mean, I mean reading and writing were like terrible. Really? Like, I must have just seen something to let you in. I couldn't. Um, no, it was a guy called Mr. File. Right. First name, not pedo. No. Um, <laughs> he was a brilliant guy, <laughs> Mr. File and Mr. Clay. You know the teachers that that kind of change your life, kind of thing. Yes, I do. This guy, this guy, Mr. Clay was extraordinary. Mr. File for my for my interview to get into the school. Yeah. I sort of turned up there, I had really long hair, and he went, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's going to work for us. But, you know, fine. And, uh, yeah, you scraped through your GCSEs, but you seem like a bright boy, whatever you chatted. I've, I've never been spoken to that way right. by a teacher and just thought, this guy's great. He's sort of treating me like yeah. an adult. Yeah. Yeah. And in return, I worked my ass off. And this guy, Mr Clay, was so open-hearted he'd he'd um he'd lost his daughter and we knew that gosh and he was like he just sort of treated us like he was in a bad mood a lot of the time and was like mental and was fantastic i saw him, he came to a gig in high wickham a while back and i was just like blown away by him being there like so touched by him turning up he was like funny and interesting and engaged and brilliant I'm uh, I'm worried that we're going to get to the end of this interview, and I'm going to have asked you about four questions. Oh, sorry, man, no, I, I no, can blather no, on all day. No, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm only worried because I feel I won't be earning my contribution. I could, I could, I'm quite happy to sit and listen. So I'll just pick at random then. The the idea that anyone can be taught to be a comedian is slightly at odds with that very powerful line you have about asking all comedians which parent was poorly, because it's the the child who uses humour to comfort. The suffering parents. So there, it's. I, I, well, I think. I, I think hang on, let me get this. Let me get yeah. this straight in my own head. So I wondered before I read the book. I saw you on the one show the other day, and I read a couple of the reviews. And I haven't read it cover to cover. I haven't had time, but I, I, I kind of wondered whether the modesty that's on every page would seem strained or would seem effortful, but it isn't. You, you, you really are, and, had, and, and yet I don't buy it completely. It's almost as if you, do, you, you, you have a natural talent, and a lot of... I don't what, know if I do, man. I know you listen, don't. That's listen, what I'm I, saying. It's not listen, fake, is it? Here's, You're not... the, here's the thing, right? Here's the absolute truth of it. Go on. I was 25, yeah. and I'd never written a joke. Yeah, I know, but you'd made, now, you'd made everybody laugh. You made now, your mum laugh. Uh, yeah, and now I write jokes every day, and I'm good at it. But that's right? different. That's the craft. You're ignoring that spa. You just spent five minutes speaking very persuasively the about the importance of genius plus effort. Well, and, and the, the thesis the is edge. close to saying it's all effort. It's finding the it's finding the edge, so finding where, the where, thing where, that you do best. Yeah. So how that's that's very important. Where did that come from then? When did you find that? When did you find the thing that? Because you're working for Shell. Mid twenties. But what? Where from? Why? Who? Well, the, well, the reason I did it was if you work for one of these big corporations, yeah. they have a training budget, right? Yeah. And, they, and I'm not going to go on some health and safety oil rig thing. I'm in the fucking Strand. What's going to happen to me? Nothing. I was so, in that building. Gosh. Yes. So okay. they would. They would. Uh, actually, I played the Savoy Over Hotel the, road, the other yeah. day, which I used to I used to kind of yeah. have a pint in the coal hole occasionally. So I would I like um, that area. It was really nice to go back and it's do some fun pub. there. Yeah, great pub. <laughs> I used to go um, there when I was desperate yeah. for a story. I was uh, a gossip columnist, and Richard Harris would be in there sometimes. Yeah, I, the I, actor. And yeah, you could he just was, start he was a chat, have a conversation. Just an amazing guy. Crazy. Uh, so, but that thing of like going. Look, that. What were we on? We're on the. Um, edge, spark. Where did edge, it come spark. from? You go on well, a course. So, mid 20s, I was quite. I wasn't the funny one in the office. I wasn't desperately trying to make people laugh in the office. I was a bit sad. I wasn't depressed. Right. I was sad, which is 
I think I talk a lot in the book about conflated words, which sounds fancy than it is. Sadness and depression, most... Sadness sort of, and depression yeah. is it, happiness and pleasure. Yeah. The idea that these things have come to mean the same, charisma and charm, sure. they mean the same thing. They're not. No, they're not. And actually, the more you pick them apart, the more you know that, it's kind of great. So I was sad, which is circumstantial. Yes. If you're depressed, it's a serotonin imbalance. You need to see a yes. medical professional. It's a disease. You write about that very powerfully but, as well. Uh, you know, suicide is, is obviously the... That, that's the, the symptom <clears throat> of depression. It's super serious. It kills more young people than cancer. Mm. There's an epidemic out there. If you're feeling those feelings, go and see a doctor. Yeah. If you're sad, like I was, much more unacceptable, yeah. have you noticed, in our society yeah. to say I'm sad. Yeah. Um, oh, you're sad. Like, it's a sad... Of course, yeah. It's much more unacceptable, yes. but it's better because you can do something about it, because you can change. Mm. And so I just... I sort of changed. I went... And I didn't leave to become a guy on TV. No. Th those jobs are not available. They're not cookie-cutter. So I left for the graft to go and... It's yo-ho-ho, -ho, a pirate's life for me. I don't want to get a wage anymore. I don't want to buy anything. I sort of instinctively knew when I was sort of 25, 26... Things aren't going to make me happy, because they hadn't. OK. So you were successful, according to some measures. Like, I was making, I don't know what I was making, 30 grand a year in whatever it was. Just, and you know, it, was, it was good. It was like 25 years ago. It was yeah, just... but it was, like, good, proper, good sure. money, had a little sports car, fun, drinking and it just friends, didn't work. In... It just didn't work. Didn't do anything <clears throat> for me. I was, you know, I was like really made low. the teeth the gears hadn't connected. They're both turning and it I hasn't... just couldn't see how... How, you know when you see your boss and your boss's boss, yeah. and I, I chatted, I had this amazing boss called Mike Harl. And not, not everyone in my life had someone die, but his wife had died. He right. was bringing up his son on his own. And he... Uh, I remember seeing him and sort of going, oh, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm going to stay. I just don't know whether this is right for me. Yeah. And I'd had an interview at, like, Boston Consulting. And he just sort of looked at me and went, what are you doing? What are you talking about? That's just... More. More of the same. That's right. just like a better place to waste your life. Just he's, He was a musician. He was a really talented musician. And his brother was a guy that played in musicals. OK. Um, I think he's a flautist. Wow. Hal's brother. Yeah, like, yeah. like he's in, like, sure. plays in, I don't know, uh, Phantom of the Opera or something. Yeah, yeah. He's, like, one of those yeah. guys. But he records as well. And I think he'd always wished he'd gone down the music route. And he was so sort of encouraging to go, yeah, just go and give it a go. Lucky again go to and have do something. encountered that, isn't but it? But that thing of, like, we've all got those people and... It's you know, you're writing listening the... or not, isn't it, really? That's the... Yeah, are you open to it? I mean, yeah. all... there's no wisdom in that book. There's no... There's nothing... No great quote that I didn't see when I was in my early 20s. Mm. But some of it means nothing to me. Or meant nothing to me then. Sure. And resonates now. It's it's interesting the way it changes. Yeah. How it's it's like you're the thing that changes through through time. You're... I think, I mean, again, you have to say it because it's self-help, but you're, <laughs> you're a verb, not a noun. You know, but if you're, yes, a, of course if you you're a doing thing, you can do better. And it changes change. the way the world responds to you but as well. When, when do most people think they're solid state? Yeah. I reckon it's like 22. Yeah. They go, that's it. For me. That's who I am. And that's it. Yeah. And you, you sort of go nurture, like, the, obviously, the nature-nurture debate. I don't give a fuck about that debate because you go, well... Obviously, nature's massively important, probably much more important, but the only bit you get to play with is nurture. Environment. But the idea that nurture ends when you're 15, 18, 21, yeah. pick a number. It doesn't. Your environment and who you put yourself around changes the whole time. I, I, I was struck by the sort of friendships run through your life, in, and, and you have an astonishing array. There's a hilarious story about you introducing Hugh Grant to Monica Lewinsky in your own kitchen, Yeah, I think. I mean, you, Hugh you, Grant's one of the funniest men that's a, never done stand-up. He's a legend, isn't he? But he did that thing, like, he met... So Monica's a friend of a friend, yeah. and uh, Hugh's a friend, and I introduced Hugh to Monica in my kitchen, and Hugh said, uh, hello, I'm the other fellatio story from 1992, <laughs> which is just... The perfect moment. It's just but Hugh Grant well. is like, he's just so funny. But I thought, again, I, I, I'm not a student of you, 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 you on or off stage, but like most people, who are the same age as you. I, I figured I knew quite a lot about you. I would, if I'd been pushed, have thought that you were quite solitary. I would have thought that you kind of didn't enjoy company and didn't but you're incredibly sociable and incredibly uh, yeah i do i do really enjoy and now it. it makes sense but listening to you here yeah. and, and reading now it makes sense because it's that feeling of people that yes. propels you onto the stage you're not a comedian who is trying i sort to of hide I, something i sort of have a theory on friendship that we Come like on. well i mean my first theory is like in show business you've got to check that it's your friends 
and they're not frenemies. Which is quite hard to do. It's And the way that it's super easy check, Yeah. if their success is your success, yeah. then fine. It's, if yeah. their success annoys you or like you hear something bad happening, you kind of go, oh, yeah. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Yeah. And it's all it's it's not them. It's like you need to kind of, sure. okay, I need yeah. to get over that to be a proper friend. It needs to be that. It's like, the opposite it, of Gore Vidal when he said that, yeah. Every time a friend succeeds a part of me dies. And and, and what you say... Well, uh, Morrissey. We hate it when our friends become successful. You're quite Morrissey in the book, although not that bit. I that was a bit I, about I, being I got to I got to email Morrissey. And ask permission. And, uh, yeah, uh, and Morrissey emailed back, and it's one of the greatest thrills of my life. He means so much to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's same, it's, same it's interesting, that thing of, like, musicians and writers that really, you know, yeah. helped you yeah. through difficult times. I think Morrissey's one of those brilliant... Because there's such humour in his songs. People in the media seem to focus on the depressive element but there's such humor yes in there in no, the dark sure. times and for me what's the point of a sense of humor when in the good times i mean great yeah of i mean course. i always think like when i do a show like i sort of say at the end of the show this thing about i hope you enjoyed it i hope none of you needed it but i'm acutely aware someone did yeah of course you know someone's recently bereaved someone's lost their job or in debt or something bad's happened they've broken their leg something and they need to laugh for two hours and forget about that thing. In the good times, like when you're on a beach with the missus, sipping a pina colada, this is fantastic. No one says anything funny because you don't need to. There's a reason beautiful people don't say funny shit because they don't need to. <laughs> Life's already great. Have you, <laughs> the, 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 well, and the, the, the other bit about friendship is, I, I'm not going to quote you correctly, but it's something about the person you are when you're with the people that yeah. you like is the I best, think that, the, that the best version of, like, of, of you. Yeah, that thing of like, we like we're, we're all quite egotistical, I think. Yeah. And we like who we are when we're with certain people. That was people. it. Yes. And so you go. I'd never thought of that before. You know that thing of like you go. Well, why? Why am I? Why do I want to spend time with her? It's, I'd never. Because I had I lunch. love the, who I am. The with day her. I read that, I had lunch with someone who I hadn't seen for years because they got divorced and but didn't pick up. But anyway, and and I, that, I work. I came back. I was reading it on the tube coming back from that lunch, thinking that's you just bloody nailed it. That's exactly. You ever had lunch with like one of those? Like I have a couple of friends that I. I make them laugh yeah. so much. Yeah. There's such a good audience yeah. for me. Yeah. And yeah. I go, I just want to have lunch with him every day. It's and amazing. And you feel a million dollars. And sometimes you have lunch with someone, they're like, yep, yep, great. Whatever. But they're not like a big... And you go, oh, I'm not sure whether I'm... Yes. You know, you feel like you're uh, the best version of yourself. That's it, yes. The, the, so, as I said, I'm just going to do this in quite a scattergun fashion. So, becoming a father quite late probably ties in a little bit to this notion you have of not being on rails, not making, you know, not hitting 22 and thinking that's it for me now. It's quite daunting to become a father in your in your mid latish 40s. I think it would have been very daunting to become a father earlier. I yeah. had like uh I think a couple of experiences kind of made me think I didn't want children. Um I viewed it as a as a thing that maybe ties you down, yes. as a thing that maybe is... To, to is, a partner, you mean? Is, no, to a... Just to, to life. life. Yes, to, to life, the child. To, to the child. To yes. the, it's a responsibility. You know, so I think, you know, I'm already uh, uh, a white guy in the UK, um, uh, you know, white male, highly educated. I'm all, I mean, I can, you talk about the guardrails up and, mm. the, and the, uh, the easy settings. Mm. Not having a kid felt like almost like a cheat on the video game of life. Yeah. Where you go, it's so easy because I'm only... So to take that risk and to go, well, I'm going to set off on my own and be a stand-up comic, didn't, you know, no dependence is a really key factor okay. in that. Um, so it was, it was a... Um, yeah, so it felt like that would be... But now it feels like we were so ready for it when it came around. And obviously, as an older parent, it takes a while to get everything going, but... It's amazing. It's a, it's a. I mean, the quote that I have in the book that I, that I love, is having a kid is like having a medical procedure, where your heart now lives outside your body. Yeah. And you go, yeah, that's kind of what it's like. It's like my, my, my kid is just waking up from a nap right now. I'll meet him in the park in half an hour. Brilliant. You, you write very beautifully about meeting his mum as well. About, about your. Yeah, the first time we met was like. Shit. Well, it was a weird thing where it was genuinely it was an audition. And I'm not the kind of guy, I don't think I, anyone would say, oh, yeah, this guy's a romantic. But I kind of knew from the jump, and I met her at this audition, and she she had to write notes on us. And <laughs> and she was, like, all dressed up for this thing in, like, some kind of, like, Japanese little dress or whatever, and she was, like, stunning. And, uh, and it was around the time my mother was dying, so I suppose my heart was very open. Yes. I think sometimes, you know, the, the, the upside of grief 
is that you're just very open to kind of letting people in. But anyway, the, the fun bit of the story is she had to write notes on us when we first won it. And she said he's a one-note comedian with the eyes of a... <laughs> So notes. I mean, that's surely. And then I kept on phoning her up. This was in the days when you could make a pass at someone you work with. Sure. I kept on phoning her up and asking her out. And, and like she would have me on speakerphone in the office and be openly laughing, and just went, oh, look, "I'll tell you out." And she took a, a long time to, to to come round to it, but eventually let me take her to dinner. It's I'm I'm you know I, I guess I'm a I'm a war of attrition guy. Well, I've got no yeah, maneuvers. But again, you're not. You're more than that. You're you're. I think you're more than you give yourself credit for, which is as I keep trying to sort of dance around this idea that has really taken me by surprise that you're not pleased with yourself at all you're, you, you, you're constantly trying to I mean there's just... a bit there's a bit in the book about the you know where I want to be yes you know and the ambition yes the ambition is still there yeah but it does uh, but okay so if I'd met you when you were 20 what would your ambition have been I don't know I think no. I think it I think at 20 there's a weird thing where and this is really I suppose the target market for the book. Yes, I know. You know well, if, I, I if people so. in their uh, college or univers university happen to come across it and read it in the summer holidays, you sort of think, oh, that might be a bit useful. Right. Because really thinking about that stuff, of like, what do you want to do? Yeah. Not just what's the next step. I mean, I really don't think I made a decision in life until I was mid 20s. Right. Because it's a conveyor did you, belt. Did you make a, yeah. 100% percent man. Sure. because you go right GCSEs to A-levels yeah. well a couple of kids left at 16 yeah. because they were feral yeah. but everyone else stayed on yeah. and then you know everyone went to university it's the could. middle class production line and you went to the best university you could yeah. and then you get a job at the best company you could yeah. you know and you weren't really trained to do anything with a liberal arts degree so it was like marketing yeah okay <laughs> sure or front of office in the city yeah. but I genuinely I had such blinkered I mean, my upbringing, when I look back, I remember someone at college saying to me he was going to go and work in a bank. Yeah. And I was like, it's like behind the plexiglass? That sounds really boring. And it was like he was going to work for, I don't know. Goldman Sachs or yeah, something like it that. It was Goldman Sachs, it. but you kind of went, oh, is that, oh, that makes more sense. What what, what then about, about Cambridge? Because normally careers like yours are forged in the footlights and you become great friends. Who, who were your contemporaries that you... Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen and Dan Mazur. And did you knock about time. with them at all? No, I did knew them. Know? I, I right. went to one, like, smoker thing. Yeah. And I was... I'd be, I'd be a pretty funny guy when I was at college, but I remember going to a smoker thing and just thinking it was all very theatrical, and I felt like it's not for people like me. Inauthentic. No, not what inauthentic, what do you mean by but theatrical? Like, it was like people that did put on plays and were actors, right. and it was all very sketch-based. Okay. And even now, I don't think I'd have the chops to do that kind of stuff. It was all—it was more akin to Saturday Night Live, and it was so ideal yeah, for right. for Sasha yeah. and for Dan Mazer, who's you know uh, doesn't get the credit he deserves, but is a brilliant, brilliant man. Yes. Um, but those guys were great, but it wasn't for me. It was like I when I came to it later, I came to stand up. And that's a very specific but thing. But were you sitting in that audience thinking, I'd quite like to be on that A stage, but not that stage at that point? Were you, no, I think we... I remember seeing Eddie Izzard when I was at college. I remember going to see his show at the Cambridge Corn Exchange. And I still, every time I play it, it feels a little bit special. But like, I always think of like, there's someone sitting in that seat over there that's going to do this. Me. There's someone that's going to do it. There's someone oh, that's yeah. going yeah. to be up here in whatever, 20 years' time, sure. doing the same thing. Um, I remember seeing that and going, no one could be that funny. Right. How could he be that funny for two hours straight? Yeah. It's like unbelievable, yeah. superhuman. Yeah. But obviously, I'm just seeing the results. I'm not seeing the hard work. I'm not seeing the 20 but that years would be you. To I'm just wondering when you came into those contemplations, when you thought that could be me, maybe, I guess. Mid-20s. But, but completely, mid to like, boom. Mid-20s. Like I remember this. being on some hippie... So you, you weren't sitting in the audience at college, at university, thinking... Oh, it's probably not for me, but my God, I wish it could be. You didn't even have that sort of wistful. No, ambition. if anything, I like music more. I like like uh, you know playing the guitar and writing songs and all of that kind of thing. That was yeah. that's what I like. I wasn't very good at it. I didn't sure. have any kind of musical ability really. Uh, and it's not a class but, thing. You're not sitting there thinking this isn't for the likes of me. This isn't. I wasn't. This. It's no, just but I didn't really. I was quite blinkered in my. Uh, you know, the thing about the bank is interesting. The thing yeah. about I didn't know what a producer was in television. No. I think if I'd known what a producer was, I've got a lot of friends that are producers. I think it's a pretty great job. Yeah. And it's it's quite dependable. Uh, less of a risk. So if you'd seen and a career I think, structure, that... I think if I'd had a if a friend of the family had yeah. been a BBC TV producer okay. that had done comedy, I probably would have gone. 
That's what I want to do. What about the I things I want to be like, John Lloyd. Yeah. If I'd met him yeah, too okay, early, I've got it. it might All have right. ruined me. So, so for me, it was like, by the time I got to it. 25, it was like shit or bust. The, the ship had sailed. Or not. So yeah, but, what about things like the graduate traineeship at Planet 24, which everyone I knew applied for? Were you not even aware of stuff like that? I was aware of that, but it was like the... the I think those things are such... I remember applying to Saatchi and Saatchi. They had some ludicrous interview to process. Write a slogan for an advert, I think. Yeah, I all that, that stuff, and they put people sort of through hell and made them yeah. work way too hard. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And they stopped. Well, I know. It's a bit crazy. I think their their methodology. Um, well, it was because in the end, you know, who did they employ? Well, it was the some, same. Yeah, um, but it was. I don't think they. Um, I think those things were a bit of a. I don't but know. You were thinking that even stuff. then, because I remember every rejection I got crushed me. Whereas you were already thinking this is well, no, I, not I, the way forward. I, no, I think I think in those first few years, I thought well, there was an arms race after college. I was yeah. very unhappy after college. Right. Really enjoyed university. Okay. And then afterwards, it was like this weird arms race of everyone saying they were doing better than everyone else. Yeah. Everyone I knew was on some doing some accountancy That's, exams. Yeah. I was going, ah, oh, no, legal exams or something. Uh, obviously, the medics were doing their own thing, and it felt like it was a there was a the competition sort of between people. And then it all, and no one was being honest suddenly. Oh, of course. Everyone was kind of bullshitting about how happy and brilliant they were. Um, so it's like an early, not everyone, early, early social media. Did you yeah. think about law or did you think about. No. Just to, always so, thought so that so might you, be boring. You fell, you fell, it depends who you're yeah. defending. And you, fell, <laughs> you, fell into, you fell into. Marketing, advertising. Marketing I think I'd w probably wanted to be in film. Right. And then didn't think that was possible. So when well, advertising's a job, and it's a bit like films. And, yeah. You know, it was like... And it was all kind a of, bit like marketing, I think. I'm not yeah. entirely sure. What well, no, and then got into advertising first, and yeah, then yeah, went, yeah. well, then I changed and went advertising. Who are these people calling me up asking me to do things? Right. Marketing managers at companies. Okay. Okay, there so I get the job there. I mean, I think this early stuff, this is... It feels like this is the thing that's interesting, though, where you kind of fall into something. You don't really think about what you want to do. Yeah. But then as soon as you do what you want to do, it becomes easy. So I was pretty feckless when I was sure. working at Shell. I wasn't really doing that much. And then you start a comedy. I'm like, I've been known now for being the hardest working man in comedy. And you go, it was a very low bar, firstly. It's like being the best looking guy in the Burns unit, <laughs> frankly. It's like you go, right, I'll just, I'll turn up to every gig I can. I'll go out every night. And the was it a course? Was it an NLP course or or a comedy course or a co what? Were they? I did you, I did both actually. You did the, do both. I got no, okay. the NLP I, course it, was more important. The NLP course was the thing that kind of made uh, me kind of go. Teaches you how to use language. I think NLP, like neuro linguistic program, it's got a weird reputation because yeah. I think a lot of people think it's like, and there's a lot of shysters in that business. But it's I think the core thing is going look. The map is not the territory. Yeah. Your your vision of the world is not how it is. That's your disposition. It's how you're seeing things is how you're seeing things. And you yeah. can change... It's easier to change that than change the world. Yeah. But there's no objective It's a core of thera all therapy, that, I think, isn't it? Is yeah, it, is it, but the, the... It, it seems much more immediate than a lot of therapies. I mean, yeah. my, my thing is I think every therapist, when they sit you down, should go, right, you know I'm not the only one doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm doing cognitive behavioural, sure. but there's also NLP, and then there's Freudian analysis. Yeah. <clears throat> and... Jungian, and we yeah, can talk about your dreams, DMT, and whatever. then the... And that and that that was a sort of fork in the road. Yeah. I think that was really like I preferred doing the course than going to work. Yeah. And then I thought, well I, I uh and then the course made me think and I, the guy that taught it was a guy called Ian McDermott. He's great nice on names. Guy. It's nice that I think. Too, too many people don't name it must be lovely to yeah. get a name checked by somebody who's gone on to be Well Ian's great. So, so Ian McDermott's written quite a lot of books on yeah. NLP, taught this course. And then he d gave this amazing sort of speech on the last day where we went, a lot of you are really sort of G'd up by this course. Yeah. And you all think you want to be trainers now, right. NLP trainers, because you've had a great experience. But go and do something. Go okay. and apply this to your lives. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> they're basically yeah. off my land. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I was, it would be... I mean, no, it's, it's, it's really it's, You want it was, people to go one, out yeah. and make a difference in other areas, not just to... Yeah, I reconnected with him recently. He's a That's really nice. interesting guy because it really felt like it was... Uh, it does feel like, you know, giving something back's nice, but sure. we're going to try and do something together. I think it was a really... That was really interesting because, for me, changing your beliefs about something, that's always the first step, and it's the bit you don't see. Yeah. So losing my religion was very important as well. Around the same time. Yeah, all happened around the same time. You hung on to it quite, quite a long time. Yeah, 25 yeah. or something, and it was a trip to Israel. 
yes. that was really yeah, uh, again, you're the right opposite that, of the right? road to Damascus, <laughs> where I just went, this is fucking Disneyland. Yeah. You know, and you're there and you're chatting to people and you're going, well, A, this is 900 years old, not 2,000 years old. Sure. So that's some bullshit for a start. And <laughs> they want to get paid for this. You, yeah. know, it's the, you know, the God I believe in isn't short of cash kind yeah. of thing. What's yeah. going on? And then you meet amazing Jewish people and, and amazing Muslim people when you're there. It's all sort of cheek by jowl. Yeah. And you go, all right, you're going to hell and you're going to hell and you're going to hell. It's the thing, I put it in the book, that yeah. thing of like, I, I'm, I don't believe in it. I only, I only don't believe in one more religion than the Pope. Yeah. He's yeah. the most religious guy in the world. And I believe in one more. <laughs> even he thinks, uh, he's Scientologist, that's a bunch of baloney. This, the, the Muslims, that's never going to yeah. happen. There is one yeah. true way to They're heaven. Fools. I, yeah, but it's like that thing of going, yeah. an atheism I don't view as this, it's often portrayed in the media. People are quite smug about it. Yeah. And it's a bit dry and intellectual. Well, it's I'm I, cleverer than you. You believe I in fairies. It, yeah, I viewed it as a rush of blood to the head. That's fantastic. Like an incredible, yeah. empowering... Liberation. Oh, this is fucking it. Yeah. And it's slightly tied with mortality. Yeah. And going, there's no next life, there's no afterlife. But yeah. there is a next Yeah, life. you said that. And I, I, know, I know exactly what you mean. And... That, that is what you... So if you'd been five years older and you had a mortgage... Mortgage would have killed me. I looked at flats. Yeah. I would have, a car nearly f***ed me. Right. Because I... Because I, that's what happens, isn't it? You, 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 well, you yeah, think, you well, I'll do this. So uh, this is... I'm sure I'm not the first to say this. I thought occasionally... When you were writing about the show years, Slough as well, hmm. um, I thought of Tim in the office a couple of times and that... Yeah, I bumped into Martin the other day. Did you? I think it's one of the most underrated... You know, obviously, oh, it's, it's a obviously Ricky Gervais and Steve Merchant wrote it, and sure. they're amazing. But Martin Freeman's performance in that it's perfect. is one of the best things I've ever seen. Complete, could not agree more. He's, he's incredible. Uh, luckily, he's done all right. Oh, can, my God, he's Hasn't he? He's done it. But, but that, for everyone from our background and, and rough generation, that's the job you started doing while you were waiting for something special to come along yeah and then you wake up one morning and that's you, you now yeah you got that how big was that window 12 months 18 months six months you just decide that if, if i don't move now i probably never will you don't yes. think you even articulated it that much i find it a scary thing to think about that's what i'm touching the sliding on. doors yes and but it's also that thing of the reason to talk about it and to talk about my anxiety around well what if i hadn't gone and where, yes. where would i be now if i hadn't gone is to say it's it wasn't preordained no and no one that you like or admire or you know if you like my comedy or like someone's music no, no one had it given to them they all had to take a chance but the calculated risk of what do i do best and where can i apply myself it's like everyone's a gambler yes everyone's taking a bit of a chance on okay so where's the where can i do best in the yeah. world yeah and yeah. it might be you know, if it's if it's art, if it's like graphic art, you go, wow, that is a long shot. There's a lot of people that are good at that, sure. and five make it in every generation, it seems. You know, so we all play the odds a little bit in our heads. Comedy was not like... It was not as popular as it is now. There were very few people touring when I started okay. touring. OK, no, OK. A couple of the old guards, so but really just no be, one. It'd be just around the time that the Mary Whitehouse experience was exploding would it and and that sort of changed things a little bit that was around and that had been you know that was on the cover of N yeah. uh, enemy and it was like it felt like that was that was a bit of a moment uh but from cambridge as well i think yeah, yeah and it was very sort of um i mean the tv show kind of blew up yeah uh, but no but i understand you're right was it wasn't like a... people doing stand-up live what, that was going on to end see comedy as well in big venues. Yeah, no one was. It was, like, it was the old guard. It was like yeah. Jethro and Roy sure. Chubby Brown. Sure. Not to be dismissive of those no, guys. No, of course not. But it wasn't. I got like... a lot in common with them. You know, they they work very hard and they do very well. But that thing of there weren't people packing out theatres. But it was like so. I came up through Edinburgh and then suddenly I was sort of a touring act. I, I'll tell you what's a triumph, if I may, in the book. It, it, in, and I hope that people listening to this read it. Obviously. But also, I hope that this doesn't address something that's already entered their mind. Like they might be thinking the thing I'm about to say. I didn't take away any sense that you were sort of saying, you too could be Jimmy Carr, or you too could enjoy... It's, it's, it's a much oh, but... kinder lesson than that. There, there, there's, there's elements in this conversation outside of the context of the book that could sound as if you are saying anyone can run a FTSE 100 company if you just follow these but you're definitely not doing no, that but, at but all there's, but there's something I think as well that the way people uh, understand stuff is through applying it to themselves 
So yes, of you, course. If, if yes, com- of course. Comedy, so you, you are your own ex- Comedy lens. throughout the book is yeah. a metaphor. Yeah. And I think there's great lessons in comedy on pattern recognition and listening and communication skills and lots of great stuff that comedians do better than regular folk, I think. Yes, and of it's, course. And it's, you know, I talk about superpowers of being a comedian. That's great. I think anyone reading the book is going to go, that has a thing where they go, oh, I'm amazing at chess. Yeah. I'm the chess guy. Maybe I should have a get yeah. this. Dig- yeah. I'd like it to inspire people to do whatever it is that they're exactly. great at. Exactly. But, yes. it, but it's not meant to be like, no, exactly. hey, do I comedy. Just wanted, no. But I do think there's something in the book where I say, I don't think anyone could be a comedian. I think everyone could be a bit funnier and lighter in life. And what's to lose? Yeah. You know, you meet people yeah. with genuinely difficult jobs and they laugh a lot. Yes, you know, do, at my shows, because I'm doing... Oh, Adam Kay being a brilliant example of, I'm, yeah, of finding course. comedy in I'm the doing darkest. incredibly dark comedy. Sure. So you get doctors, you get yeah. uh, first responders, you get soldiers, you get people with a very dark sense of humour that go, well, we sort of have to. You sort yeah. of... It's battle-born. Is that the reason they get into those jobs in the first place, that they're able to deal with that stuff? Yeah. I think that might be it. Yeah, maybe. That actually, if you've got... You know, and as I said earlier, there's no point in a sense of humour in the good times. Deathbed is when you need it. When someone dies is when you need it. What you know, when you get the bad news and you can laugh because you can't be frightened and laugh at the same time. We really, when you laugh, everything. Let's, my advocacy of laughter, like the it, you know the vagus nerve kicks in and just and everything changes. Mm. It changes your state. I mean, I'm so passionate about the idea. Yes, you are. I'm a drug dealer. Sure. And the drugs are already on you yeah. when you come to the show. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just tickling them out. I'm just, <laughs> the, you know, the endorphins that you get from comedy. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mix of cocaine and heroin. It's all of those chemicals. Yeah. All of the good shit, that's what scientists call it, is, is there. <laughs> and when just... we laugh and when we give ourselves permission to laugh, no one laughs watching TV at home. They chuckle a little. It's a group experience. It's tribal. Watching it with someone else is a completely different... Of course. OK. Um, we, we're going to run very, very quickly through, then, the, 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 the career, as it were. So you knocked shell on the head. You took voluntary redundancy, so you had your bills covered for a few months, presumably, and you just thought, right, let's go. I just, and, so I went out... And it happened quite quickly, and I, I know um, you've already established that it wasn't... You didn't... It, ha- it happened quickly in terms of time. Yeah. It happened... Uh, it happened slowly in terms of experience. Yeah. So I, I was, it probably happened for me inside two years. In those two years, I went out 300 plus nights a year uh, to multiple clubs. That's not per normal, night. is it? I mean, no. that's. But it was like, it was so easy to do, so easy to kind of go. London has this incredible scene. So sure. you live your life as like a reverse of a punter. Yeah. So when you're a comedian, yeah. you start off seeing Eddie Izzard at the Corn Exchange, yeah. and then you go to the Comedy Store in Leicester Square, and yeah. you go, wow, this is good, and there's four comics I've never heard of, all doing 20 minutes. I liked him, I liked him, mm. I, I liked her, I didn't like him, yeah. whatever their thing is. Yeah. And then you end up in upstairs in a pub somewhere watching newbie acts. Mm. And on the other two things, you've kind of gone, I could never do that. Right. And then you're watching the newbies going, I could do that. Right. I'll be funnier than him. Yeah. And then you kind of, it takes you a long time to get back to performing on that big stage. So it felt to me like I knew what I wanted to do. I was meeting new people. Immediately I went to the first comedy club. I went, ah, these are my people. There's a lovely quote about comedians like, out for ourselves, but in it together. That is nice. My friend uh, Alan Havey, who's a comedian. He's also in Mad Men. He's a wonderful man. And he said, out for ourselves, but in it together. Like We're not in competition. We're not like actors in that respect. So it's like, it doesn't matter if you're funny because I'm funny in a different way. Sure. And the audience live in a moment. They're not, it doesn't matter. Um, and and the, the one person in the room facing the wrong way is another great description because yeah. I think we're all slightly off. That's a lovely description. Were there milestones, Jimmy? Were there moments where you would now, in retrospect, think that were moments of significance? Yeah. I think probably the big break was... I, the Edinburgh Festival, which if so anyone... Two years in, Perrier nomination. Perrier. Yeah, if anyone's listening to this, like, yeah. going, it could be young, could be old, yeah. but again, and you've gone, I've heard of the Edinburgh Festival, and that sounds something... It's probably for someone else, isn't it? Yeah. That's what I thought. I thought it was like people putting on plays, and yeah. it's going to be boring Shakespeare, Edinburgh sounds cold. I'd never been. I wish i discovered it earlier in life. It is so great yeah. uh, who's who's going to spain for two weeks on holiday yeah, yeah, yeah. hoping to have fun I'll tell you where they're making fun yeah. edinburgh it's very true it's so wildly exciting uh, to go up there as a punter and just see loads of no shows and it's so much easier than music yeah. to go oh well, i'll go and see a comedy show and uh, you know the people that went to see uh, phoebe Waller-Bridge uh, is a good example mm. but that went to see fleabag in edinburgh 
they feel like they own her mm. because they saw it first. Mm. The people that saw me in my first year in Edinburgh, like I still get people coming to shows and like coming up afterwards and going, we saw you in the Pleasance wow. in 2002 yeah. and we come back every year. And it's like, you're their guy. Of course. I love that. That's beautiful. I mean, it's so great though, the Edinburgh Festival. So did that, the first big, big break was there was a tribute to uh, Peter Cook. Yeah. I'd done Edinburgh, I'd been nominated for the Perrier. Um, I was going to do the Raw Variety, had been booked on that for November. And this was like late September, maybe? And it was all big hitters at this show, like in the West End yeah. Theatre, to raise money for the family, I think it was, yeah. it was a benefit. Uh, and they were all, everyone else, like Jonathan Ross and David Baddiel and uh, Angus Dean, lots of people that have become my friends, sure. were on the bill. They were all performing Peter Cook routines. Yeah. And I was from the circuit. And one of the rules of the circuit is you don't do anyone else's jokes. Right. That's like quite yes. drummed into you. Yes. So I got there and they went, oh, you know, would you do something? Something? And I went, no, I'm not doing his stuff. I'll do five minutes of my stuff. If you want that, great. So my advantage was I was young, inexperienced, and that paid off. So I went and did that gig. And you don't often, you won't often hear me say this, but I took the roof off. Yeah. Because in a two-hour show, I was the only bit the audience hadn't heard. Right. And also, everyone else Very was Very bold of you, though, to, to, to sort of be in that company and to sort of lay down the law a bit. Would it have come across like that, or would it have come... I don't think so. I think it would have been... I think it probably would have come across as appropriate modesty. Of going, look, Peter Kay's one of the Sweet. greats. Go on, yeah. I ain't doing a Peter K uh, uh, Peter, as Cook, a yeah. Peter Cook. Yeah. Sorry. I'm not doing a Peter Cook routine. Peter Kay's one of the greats. <laughs> it's a very funny bloke. Um, but that thing of, like, I'm not doing one of his routines, I'll do my routine. Yeah, OK. Yes, and then, right, so it, it wasn't being an experience balls. pays it off. Was, it was actually quite humble of you to do that. I'd say this is not my place to do the Peter Cook stuff rather than hmm. at this point to, 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 to I insist on doing my own material or, or no material at all. No, it wasn't and being then, pompous. And it was, you know, I've quoted Peter, Peter Cook in the, in the book. It's one of my favourite lines of all time. That he's in the in the 1960s, he's oh, the late 60s, yeah. he's at a cocktail party, and he says, <laughs> <laughs> someone comes comes up to him, he's chatting away, he goes, uh, what are you up to? And the guy goes, I'm writing a book. And he went, neither am I. That's <laughs> too superb. And it does, you know, really sums up the thing in neither the inspiration I. element of my book. Yeah. The bit of going, get out there and do it. Because you're not in competition with the people that talk a good game. No. You're only in competition with the tiny percentage of people that actually do it and give it a go. And you go, that takes 95% of them out the, out, the, out the door. The people that talk about putting on an Edinburgh show and never do it. Yeah. You're only in competition with the people that write a novel. Yeah. So you're not in competition with the people that, that oh, no, I'm doing what actually, I'm nearly, I'm actually starting next week. I mean, I've cleared the thing, I'm going to, eh. It's it, great. It's it, a real, yeah. it's quite empowering. Well, it is. It is empowering. And yet, I don't know, I, I, I kind of, I wonder how I'd have felt reading it at, at 26. I wonder whether I would have felt a bit intimidated by all of the possibility and opportunity that you're opening up in front of me. If I was on my treadmill, if I was on my... But playing playing small serves no one. Yeah. You know, that idea of going, you are capable of greatness and you you deserve happiness, go and find it for yourself. You know, that, that thing of like... I mean, uh, the, otherwise the, what? Otherwise yeah. what? I mean, the objectivism thing's really interesting, the Ang Rand stuff of yeah. like going, look, she's been misinterpreted by a lot of people and it's all about... Uh, pleasure and gratification it isn't it's about happiness yeah or, and that's certainly what i take from it sure the idea of you know i take uh, it's often that thing of like what do you take from writers yeah and it doesn't have to be what the received wisdom is i mean right. I, I think nietzsche's eternal return i think my interpretation of that is maybe not what he meant but i take it, but it to works mean, for you yeah so the lesson i got from reading nietzsche was like look if you had to live your life again is it a blessing yeah. or a curse? Is is it is yeah. it going to be a curse if you had to live your life again, or yeah. is it a blessing? Yeah. And if it's yeah. if it's a curse, yeah. then you're not living the right life for you. And if it's a blessing, then you're living a a whatever he would talk about, super mensch or whatever, Uber. some fucking yeah. nonsense. Should, but, well, yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah, people have taken. But that, that lesson's really good. I think that thing of like going, if you're that not enjoying is, it, that yeah. bit, that well, that now that interpretation of it is, yeah. it's, it's, it's Take important. Take and fuck the stuff the Nazis liked. Well, like, yeah, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, um, I prefer yours. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> I prefer your version. <laughs> um, so we come to to an end. I, I noticed in, in in some of the publicity you've done for the book, everybody talks about the tax thing, and you talked about it earlier. You said I presume we'll be coming onto this. Why? I think it's 
interesting being publicly shamed. Yeah, but it was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago, but it's it's still it's something that kind of those things kind of hang around. Yeah, I'd never I really addressed it. I was publicly. disappointed by the journalism actually. I thought that's such a I yeah, suppose but, they think you won't want to talk about it. They establish whether you do yeah. or not. You make it perfectly clear you're more than happy to talk about yeah. it. I think, well, here's the line. Yeah. Is, listen, if I wrote a biography and didn't mention being publicly shamed right. in my tax affairs, that would you'd be feel weird. a bit shortchanged. Maybe. As did HMRC. <laughs> well done. There you go. That's, the, that's a joke-shaped <laughs> and, thing. And but that, that thing of, like, I've got no problem talking about that, I think it was, it's interesting in the middle of cancel culture yeah. to talk about your experience of being cancelled. Yeah, OK. And... I think cancel culture is all very well. Like, as I say, I'm very passionate about being an atheist, but religion does some things better. And they, they do cancel culture much better because the cancel culture is nothing more than being shunned. Sure. And, sure. Uh, you know, when you, when you cancel someone, that's the new burning books, man. Yeah. Do you want to be the person burning the book? And, and the other thing that the religion gets right is redemption. Yes. Redemption and a way back. Yes. Repentance and redemption. We don't have that. It's like everything's happening. It's almost like a J.G. Ballard novel. Like everything's happening at once. Yeah, yeah. And all the news is happening twenty-four hours a day. It's puritanical it's... as well, isn't it? I mean, the, the yeah elements of the cancel culture are the worst sorts of. Yes, it's interesting. Like when I was when I was growing up, all the all the um, censorship came from the right, and, and now... now all the censorship comes from the left. Uh, it's it's quite an interesting yes. shift. Yeah. Where it, it's yes, about. It is, and I hadn't thought of it like that. Yeah. Before. Well, it's very interesting the shifts in politics. Like when you when you think about like the really interesting shifts in politics. If you look at the early eighties American politics, this is just this is mm. nothing. But we might as well chat about stuff. Um, in the early eighties, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats had exactly opposing views on abortion. Yes. And and they and they turned it round because they realised that was a hot topic that they could use. But it was it was the. Uh, uh, the 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 people on the left said, yeah. "Oh, actually, yeah. uh, that fetus has a right to live," and the people on the on the right saying, "No, no, she's got a right to choose." It it switched around. Nothing's Fascinating. Set. What next, then? I don't mean that in a glib sense. I I I, I mean, you're not going to have another three quarter life crisis. Three quarter fifty six. No half life crisis are you you're happy with where you are you, i don't know you, you, you i don't know if this life. isn't a midlife crisis at the moment i mean like uh, i've had quite a lot of cosmetic work done yeah. i had a hair transplant you know <laughs> i got my good. teeth did a bit of botox so that's an interesting thing i think there's i think you go through stages i'm really enjoying being a father i think that i'm enjoying this phase so this is actually trying three. to get yeah, well, now, in a way. I think so, but I'm also really the year and a half off of not performing makes you realise how much you love your job, and I'm right. trying to work a little bit harder at comedy than I have in probably the last ten years. What does that mean? Well, you can turn up and do the show. Yeah. Once you have a show written, you could just turn up and do it for a year yeah. and a half. You could not phone it in, but it's like sure. it gets easier. Uh, or you could work in it and do new jokes every time and do new bits and try and push yourself and try and write better, longer form stuff. So I'm trying to do that. Did you probably the final? question just just tying all of that together then when you got cancelled did you think it might all be over yeah yeah and, I thought, and I thought, sean lock played a big part perhaps in well making sure that I mean, it wasn't i mean, I mean if night. you compare my experience to angus eaton's experience yeah i was supported yeah. my producer friends at the show supported me my friends so it was sean mickey yeah. flanagan sarah milligan yeah supported me they were funny and they rinsed me sure. the great thing about doing a topical show about the most talked about thing in the news when you're the most talked about thing in the news is you get to be in the stocks yeah okay. now the good advice i got from a producer often like it's the ego of the performer goes yeah i nailed that show yeah i didn't nail that show i was going into it thinking what am i going to say right and my producer ruth phillips went you can't clap back yeah shut up and take it take, take your medicine, medicine and you, that's okay. Yeah. It's okay. They but you did have genuine, this could be it now. Yeah, the nerves that week were just extraordinary. Like, I, I suffer with anxiety anyway, but yeah, the... something else you write the, about very powerfully. The anxiety attack that week was like, I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, sure. couldn't sit still. I mean, anxiety, I mean, panic attacks for people that haven't had them, God love you, I hope yeah. you never do. Yeah. But it's like you, you don't fit in your own skin. You, do, you, can't, you can't do anything. Um, but you could kind of make it through. I kind of wandered zombie-like through the week and then... It felt like there's, there's a long tail on those things. Yeah. So yeah. I, th I thought it was interesting. I'm surprised thing to it's still about. wagging, to be honest. Those, I, I, you, it's good. You're right. You have to write about it. I'm just surprised yeah. that so many of the interviews have picked up on it. So, I mean, a couple of them open with it, don't they? The BBC piece opens with Yeah. Prime Minister David Cameron has said tax arrangements have 
Well, yeah, but I mean, being called morally reprehensible by, by, by David, David Cameron, Cameron is quite quite a high bar, yeah. isn't it? You go, <laughs> hang on, are you the austerity guy <laughs> that gave us? <laughs> um, so at twenty, no ambition. At twenty-five, ambition to be a life less ordinary. That you pulled yeah. that off. And and I mean, do you have shallow ambition? Like, would you like to be in a? Well, you have been already. I mean, is there anything on on your wish list that you haven't so ticked? So much. Like what? So much. I mean, listen, there's a Mount Rushmore of comedy. Yeah. There's, a, there's the greats. OK. I'm not anywhere close to that, but I'm on the trail. Yeah. I'm on the same... There's a mountain, and yeah. I'm like, I'm on the trail, and I've got a ticket, and I could do it. Most of my favourite stand-ups did their best work in their 50s. I'm not in my 50s. No. I, I, I feel like there's a lot of work to do, there's a lot more to learn, there's... I could get better. That's nice. And... It feels like the reason stand-up makes me happy is because it's a task without end. Yeah. It's never done. Great. So there's there's lots to do. And, you know, from a personal point of view as well, there's, you know, it's it's a, it's a fun thing to kind of show a different side. After 20 years in, in kind of show business, yeah. it felt like appropriate to open up a little bit and share who I am. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for this, Jimmy Carr. It's great. Great chatting, man. It was really fun. 